Hey everyone, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with our weekly update on social media. Thank you as always for joining us. So much happening here in Washington and of course impacted by that uh, kangaroo court proceeding up in New York, the incredible outrageous trial uh, where President Trump has been placed on the dock by the Democratic Party in an effort to rig the elections. Obviously, I'll give you a big update on that. Uh, we have massive new disclosures from the FBI about Fauci's gain-of-function research and what it was designed to do. Uh, you're going to be completely shocked by what you hear, or maybe you won't be shocked, but you will be outraged nevertheless. Uh, we had a court hearing this week about the manifesto of the shooter in the Covenant uh, uh, school shooting case. Incredible delays there. And I'll talk to you about uh, what happened there. We got some clips from the oral argument about our efforts to get the full truth about that terrible shooting. Uh, and then we have this big lawsuit over uh, the failure of the Biden administration to come clean about the failure of Joe Biden to keep classified records classified and secure. Uh, so a, a, an, an interesting new lawsuit in that regard. There's so much going on, and on top of everything else, there's this fight here in the House over the speakership, um, a failure in impeachment. So, uh, you know, I guess buckle up because it's going to be quite the update. Uh, first is the outrageous, without precedented, political, banana republic style, abusive, election interfering, criminal trial of President Trump. He committed no crimes worthy of investigation, let alone prosecution. Uh, the jury is now fully picked, meaning there are 12 jurors and six alternates. Uh, they were picked from the jury pool in New York, which is, tends to be overwhelmingly, at least voter-wise, uh, anti-Trump and anti-Republican and anti-conservative. Uh, and it began, the trial began with the prosecutors coming in saying Trump violated gag orders or a gag order that was, in my view, unconstitutional and unduly restrictive. And they said to the judge, not only should he be fined, but if he does it again, he should be jailed. So that's the first thing they're talking about, jailing Trump. And, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a quick video highlighting Judicial Watch's concerns about these issues. Well, this is a day that's going to go down in infamy with the beginning of those kangaroo court proceedings up in New York against President Trump. Really outrageous. He committed no crimes. In fact, he's being prosecuted for non-crimes. This is a prosecution about nothing, and he's not going to get a fair trial. It's pretty clear uh, in a courtroom controlled by Democratic Party operatives, not only in the prosecutor's office, but frankly behind the bench. And Judicial Watch denounces in the strongest possible term terms this brazen attempt to interfere in our elections and to make Trump a political prisoner. Nothing like it's happened in American history and all Americans in good faith uh, should reject this effort to try to rig our elections and you can be sure Judicial Watch will continue to confront and expose this terrible assault on our constitutional republic. You know and it's worth highlighting just how absurd the legal case here is which is that Trump you know, many years ago, well past the statute of limitations in the ordinary, under ordinary circumstances, uh, made false business records that no one else saw. He just, they were characterized falsely, so it is alleged as legal payments related to his lawyer paying money for a confidentiality agreement with Stormy Daniels. And then, um, because they passed the statute of limitations, or they had already run, they hooked it into felony charges related to federal campaign finance law, absurdity on top of absurdity. And even then, arguably, the statute of limitations still had run. So even though a trial is commencing and a jury has been seated, it has all the appearance of justice Effectively, there is no justice there. 
And uh, as, as I kind of highlighted here, I want to go through some of the other points we made. Trump committed no crimes, and as I said in the clip, it's a prosecution about nothing. It's the famous Seinfeld line from his program many years ago. I guess it's too many years ago. It seems like it was just yesterday for those of us with a certain age. These and other Democratic Party political prosecutions of Trump are an abomination unto law and are destabilizing our nation. I mean, you kind of see the echoes of that with that terrible tragedy in New York where uh, this seemingly mentally ill person set himself on fire outside the courthouse. But it destabilizes the nation because it, it tells half the country, we're going to rig the election by putting your candidate in jail. It tells Americans, it tells Americans friends and enemies abroad that they're, um, a country, this country has abandoned the principles of the rule of law. I mean, Putin must be thinking, who do they think they are to lecture me? Biden's trying to put his political enemies in jail too. You know, and Merchant is the Democratic Party operative slash judge. Alvin Bragg, Democratic Party politician slash judge. They're all politicians up there, even on the court. It's literally true. Merchant himself was a supporter of Joe Biden's campaign. Wrote a check. And then there's this issue, just the kind of the sort of the the petty vicious, viciousness of this process. There's this issue about whether Mr. Trump uh, can go to his son's funeral. And um, and he came out and made a statement. And I did, you know, one of my Instagram watch videos of his statement. Here, here it is. As you know, my son is graduating from high school, and it looks like the judge will not let me go to the graduation of my son, who's worked very, very hard. Uh, he's a great student. I'm very proud of the fact that he did so well. And I was looking forward for years to have graduation with his mother and father there, and it looks like the judge isn't going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. If you read all of the legal pundits, all of the legal scholars today, there's not one that I see that said this is a case that should be brought or tried. It's a scam. It's a political witch hunt. It continues, and it continues forever. And we're not going to be given a fair trial. It's a very, very sad yeah, now I said it was Barron's funeral. It was his graduation, obviously. I, um, uh, but it's outrageous. It's just truly outrageous. And as far as I'm concerned, Trump is a political hostage right now. Biden, you've seen, has been campaigning. Um, whether he's been effectively campaigning or not is another matter. But he's been free to campaign for the last week. He was traveling all up and down or across Pennsylvania. And uh, in the meantime, Trump is being held as a political hostage in a courtroom run by his political allies, Biden's political allies. Trump is being held hostage and unable to campaign. I mean, he did manage to go up to this bodega the other day and, and get some news attention that way, but it's only because he happened to be in New York City and he took advantage of the fact he was there. But he's not able to campaign in the swing states and things like that. The way Bi that Biden now is it now literally is doing in, Pe in in Pennsylvania, and this is going to go on for six was it six eight weeks maybe even longer. Trump is going to be held hostage there, and you can be sure they will try to jail him even prior to any conviction, based on his alleged violations of these gag orders. So they're going to use the court process as a vehicle to put him in jail, or at least that's what I predict. And I had some tweets explaining some of my concerns here as it relates to the abuse of process, especially with uh, the jury selection, in which the media has been focused on. Obviously, it's a big deal. You're sitting there, you want to know the jury's going to be fair, but it doesn't really change the nature, the corrupted nature of the process. And this is what I said. Sorry, folks, but the kangaroo court proceedings run by Democratic Party politicians against Trump won't be sanctified by any jury. Dragooning citizens to play jurors in this show trial over non-crimes is yet another abusive process. So um, I'll go on to this in a second here. 
So I want to finish this point. The poor jurors, and I, you know, let's just presume they're there in good faith. None of them volunteered. They were called in. Uh, why are they being abused like this? To me, this is an abuse of Trump and an abuse of the jurors because no jury should be asked to judge the freedom of President Trump on these charges. And so that's why the prosecutors were kind of bending over backwards where you saw this hiccup earlier where uh, one of the jurors evidently had lied on his form and it turned out and the prosecutors called him out on it because he had like been involved in tearing down uh, conservative oriented posters or something like that and was arrested for it. I'm not quite sure what the story is because it's vague because of the privacy issues related to the juror selection process. And everyone's saying, well, the prosecutors pointed that out. The prosecutors are desperate to get a jury because they know the process is the punishment and they want the jury to be there to ratify and bless their corruption. And as I say, sanctify it. And it ain't gonna work. Let's go to this next tweet. Outrage, the Democratic Party political show trial. That's what it is. It's a show trial. It's an abomination, as I say. The process begins today. It's a kangaroo court process with Trump, as I say, being gagged from criticizing the ethical recusal, the ethics recusal scandal caused by the judge and his Democratic consultant daughter. What a failure of our institutions. And this is an important point. What a failure of our institutions that Trump is facing the very real prospect of becoming a political prisoner. Now, Trump is literally on trial, but I'd say, effectively speaking, our system of government's on trial, our justice system's on trial. Is it going to be broken and mangled and permanently scarred as a result of this abuse of Trump? And remember, this is just the beginning. We have uh, prosecutions from the Biden regime directly through Jack Smith. We have prosecutions through Fannie Willis, the corrupt prosecutor down there who's not only pursuing corruptly a political case like Alvin Bragg, but also uh, a personally corrupt case because of her lies and financial interests in moving the case forward against Trump. All fully funded, all fully funded by the Republican-controlled Congress, time and time again. I mean, while this is going on, Mayor Orcas, of course, was, he had already been impeached by the House over the invasion. And uh, the Senate, the Democrats did what I encourage, frankly, Republicans to do with the Trump impeachments, which was to shelve them and not even have a trial. And that's what they did with the border invasion that uh, Mayorkas was impeached for. They refused to have a trial on Mayorkas' impeachment over his enabling an invasion like the United States that's never occurred before. And this was my initial clip here on that. So another bad day for America today. The Senate dismissed impeachment charges without a trial against Biden Homeland Chief Maya Rorcus, uh, real outrage. First time in history, I think it's happened. Of course, he was impeached for enabling an invasion of the United States like something we've never seen before. And this is on top of Republicans. It looks like um, giving up on Biden's impeachment ultimately. When push comes to shove, they probably won't impeach him. And even as Trump faces jail time for non-crimes and harassment like we've never seen before by the Biden regime, the left and their Democratic allies. Now, Judicial Watch won't give up. We'll keep on with the heavy lifting for the rule of law, the U.S. Constitution. We need to confront, expose, and stop this assault on our sovereignty, our Constitution, and frankly, the very fabric of our nation. Yeah, and it, it, the fails continue as far as I'm concerned. The fails continue. Uh, they're... Uh, uh, there was this Ukraine foreign aid bill that was passed out of the House today. Uh, Speaker Johnson is facing threats to his speakership uh, because of his efforts to, um, 
or his willingness to rely on Democrats essentially to run the House and to get bills passed, including, as I note, the full funding of the abuses of Trump. And um, that was another opportunity to shut down the funding of Jack Smith, cut off federal funding for entities and, and localities or states that are abusing the civil rights of Donald Trump and others, like up there in New York or in Fulton County, Georgia. Zero interest in doing that. As this is going on in New York, what have Republicans been doing to help Trump? I tell you, if it were Democrats, and I wouldn't blame them doing, for doing this, and there was a similar political prosecution by a Republican prosecutor, they'd have that prosecutor in Congress every other day. And everyone in his office, and anyone who ever talked to him. I don't know if you can hear my chair squeaking, but I can. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> so our system of government is failing. Our justice system is failing. Now, Judicial Watch, of course, relies greatly on our justice system. I mean, we're in court, hundreds of lawsuits. We filed and are, you know, we're pursuing probably 75 as we speak right now actively. Uh, but we rely on our, our courts to curtail the abuses of government and per that's what they're supposed to be there for, to restrict abuses by the other branches of government and to defend our civil liberties and make sure that even if you're a defendant, you're there for the right reasons and not for unlawful reasons, meaning political retaliation. They're failing in all respects with the comes, when it comes to Trump on that. What is it we can do? I think you need to share with your members of Congress and your friends and family and other people that you consider these corruption issues core to your concerns on public policy. I mean, we, we're not gonna have a country that we would recognize as America if we allow this to continue. If our justice system becomes just another tool for politicians to jail other politicians, that's not America anymore. And of course, you should support Judicial Watch because we, again, continue to take a leadership role in confronting and exposing all of this corruption, this abuse of power. Indeed, that's why we've been targeted by Jack Smith, harassed by Jack Smith. That's why the FBI came to my house to intimidate me and retaliate against me and Judicial Watch for our work calling out the corruption in the illicit targeting of Trump. I mean, the election, as I said once, said before, and said again, and will say again, has already been compromised. I mean, I made the point in my big CPAC speech earlier this year. Let's go to that clip. You know, but frankly, you gotta begin with some bad news. It's too late. The 2024 election has already been compromised by the Biden Democratic Party's unprecedented prosecutorial assault on the civil rights of President Donald J. Trump. There is a storm front, a storm front of selective, vindictive, political, and anti-constitutional prosecutions going from Miami, up through Fulton County, Georgia, to here in DC, and of course up into New York. And the front has expanded to other states where lawyers, Republican Party officials, and volunteers are being harassed, sued, disbarred, and prosecuted for exercising their God-given First Amendment and other rights to dispute an election. Yeah, our elections are under assault, and it seems no one here in Washington wants to talk about it. No one here in Washington wants to talk about it. I give Ukraine 10 times the money they're asking for if we cut $1 from Jack Smith's budget. I exaggerate, but you, you get my point, don't you?
You have all the FISA warrants you want if we start putting people in jail. Maybe give the FBI their new headquarters if you defund Alvin Bragg. I mean, those are the sorts of negotiations that should be taking place, but the focus seems to me out of focus in terms of the gravity and the real disruption to the American way we face from our own government's misconduct and the Biden administration's willingness to try to rig the election. Right now, what you see in New York that's evidence of election interference. That's election rigging. As sure as stuff and ballots. You know, and I'd be remiss if I don't highlight the ongoing effort to, to rig elections and put their thumb on the scale in the short, long, and uh, the short, medium, and long term by allowing countless millions of foreign nationals to walk across the, well, not even walk across the border. They, Biden flies them into the United States, these illegal aliens. I know Mike Johnson's under a lot of criticism, but at least he did, at least gave the appearance of doing something important on this issue. The other day, I had a, a, a watch video of his comments with President Trump the other day. And so what we're going to do is introduce legislation to require that every single person who registers to vote in a federal election must prove that they're an American citizen first. You have to prove it. That will be a new uh, uh, part of the federal law and a very important one. Our bill will establish new safeguards. It'll put us on par, by the way, with virtually every other democracy around the world that also prohibits non-citizen voting. And, and this is a, a critical thing for us to do at a, at a very critical time. Our bill also will require states to remove non-citizens from their existing voter rolls. That's a big problem, too. And, and it will provide access to databases from the Department of Homeland Security and the Social Security Administration to help the states administer this. At, 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 as the entity that is responsible for regulating federal elections, Congress has this responsibility. We cannot wait for widespread fraud to occur, uh, to occur uh, especially when the threat of fraud is growing with every single illegal immigrant that crosses that border. This is something most Americans are deeply concerned about. The latest poll says 78% of the Americans who are polled say that preventing illegal immigrants from voting in our elections is a top priority. I've, in every place I've gone around the country, whether it's out west, midwest, Long Island, deep south, it doesn't matter. Everybody is concerned about this. We have a job. Now, you know, that bill, again, that's a thumbs up there. That bill is unlikely to pass uh, because Democrats control the Senate and they don't want election integrity, meaning uh, a, a way to ensure that non-citizens don't vote. Uh, but it's important that there be leadership in this area and bills like this are raised because eventually bills, in order to get a bill like that passed, you have to generate support and leadership on it. And that's why... It's good and important what Speaker Johnson did there. Uh, you know, the left has you believe that citizens can't vote. Well, of course, legally they can't vote. They're not supposed to vote. But there's no check in place to ensure that when someone registers the vote, that they're actually citizens. Meaning you sign the, the registration form doesn't ask if you're a citizen. Uh, it doesn't require proof of citizenship. Wait, it may ask if you're a citizen, but it doesn't require proof of citizenship. And states aren't allowed to require proof of citizenship to vote, at least in federal elections. So the state of law is, is a one giant loophole inviting foreign nationals to commit voter fraud with virtual, virtually no way of double checking what they're doing. And so it further compromises, especially the large number of foreign nationals here, it further compromises because there are no checks in place. Our elections. And of course, just their mere pre presence are going to change the apportionments of the apportionment of Congress after the next census, as I've talked about before, and the electors for the presidential 
electoral college. So places where there are a lot of legal aliens will gain more political power, even though there may be less citizens there, thanks to the Biden border invasion. Oh, before I, before I, I have, uh, there's so much going on, I had to write what we're gonna talk about down. Normally I can keep track of it in my noggin, but not today. Uh, other big news this week, speaking of election rigging, is uh, the debate about the January 6th prosecutions. The Justice Department has um, stretched a law that was passed after the financial crisis of 2008, or maybe it was before 2008, maybe it was Enron scandal, it, was, it might have been back before then, Sarbanes-Oxley, which is a, a regulation of the private sector uh, supposedly to protect us, right? But essentially it, it makes it, um, uh, they add more federal sanctions and law and, and crimes to messing with official proceedings related to financial crimes. Now for the first time in the history of the law that had been around for at least 20 years plus, they started prosecuting January 6 demonstrators or people involved in the disturbance uh, for being involved in trying to obstruct an official proceeding. And the courts have been in, um, have kind of been confused about that, meaning one judge said in the District of Columbia, well, that's not what the law is designed to do. You're applying the wrong law here. This doesn't apply in these circumstances. And of course, the Biden Justice Department got a bunch of other judges to say otherwise. And the Supreme Court was skeptical enough is that they brought it up almost immediately, practically speaking. And they had hearings on it earlier this week. And I'm glad there were hearings or oral arguments on it. And I encourage you to listen to the full oral arguments uh, because it highlights how the Biden Justice Department and it exposes the, uh, the political abusive prosecutions of the January 6th defendants. As I commented here about the Justice Department Solicitor General under Biden, uh, she was doing backflips before the Supreme Court to explain why leftist demonstrators weren't prosecuted as January 6th defendants were. Because this law related to official proceedings or obstructing official proceedings, this is the first time it's been applied to First Amendment related demonstrations or anything like that even though you had left, leftists engaged in demonstrations that arguably violated their, the, the, the law as applied by the Biden Justice Department for the first time. The point being, they weren't, they weren't prosecuting leftists and they were prosecuting Trump supporters. And the Justice Department was before the Supreme Court trying to explain how they probably will never prosecute leftists under this law. You know, Justice um, Sotomayor, you know, she said something crazy. She just falsely, she falsely stated, as I said in the tweet, that there is no precedent for people trying to stop a proceeding violently. And that's, not, that's simply false. The Kavanaugh hearings were repeatedly and violently obstructed. I witnessed it in person. Now, I went to both Kavanaugh hearings. There were two sets of Kavanaugh hearings. There were the kind of the, that was the first set that was the traditional uh, um, hearing of uh, a confirmation hearing, I should say. And you, you wouldn't believe what was going on. I witnessed it. I was sitting in the, in the hearing room. The left would come into the hearing room. They'd be sitting in the public section. And they'd get up and start screaming and the police would have to remove them. It was violent. There was violence going on in the Senate office buildings. I knew about it, I heard about it. Members of the Senate were being targeted and threatened with violence in order to get these official proceedings obstructed and to derail the Kavanaugh hearings and the nomination in its entirety. It continued in the second set of hearings where um, the um, the rather odd lady who falsely, in my view, accused Kavanaugh of sexual assault, and they had that show trial hearing of Kavanaugh, 
Now, those hearings were a bit more calm in the hearing room, but on the outside, uh, the left was just running amok in the Senate. Cornering senators, it was a terribly threatening, intimidating, and quasi-violent atmosphere. My point being, many of those people could have been prosecuted. They didn't have any right to be there under the rules for inter you know, uh, demonstrations within an office building like the Senate office buildings. They weren't prosecuted like the January Sixers were. I saw it. I mean, I wasn't directly threatened, but I certainly recognized there was an air of violence around it. And certainly the senators must have been nervous. They obviously were nervous. I was talking to a reporter the other day uh, who was asking me about whether, because I had called on repeatedly in, a, in, a, in the CPAC speech I made that the next honest president should um, pardon the January Sixers. And I think, you know, the reporter said, well, you think all of them? I said, yeah, all of them. Because the whole process has been compromised and it was political. So is it possible that someone committed a crime that should have been prosecuted at the federal level? Of course, of course it's possible. Was this Justice Department engaged in a way that could ensure to me or any other sensible person that such crimes were being prosecuted justly and justice was being fairly administered, even for criminal defendants who seemingly did something wrong? No. And that's why Trump or whoever is elected who's the next honest president, and hopefully maybe a Democrat will come to a sensible conclusion like this, should pardon everyone. If they're in jail, let them out. And frankly, the Supreme Court hearings this week highlighting the Justice Department's abuse of process, misuse of the law, rewriting the law to try to put their political opponents in jail. By the way, two of those charges are that are two of the charges against Trump that the Jack Smith gang is trying to use to put Trump in jail were at issue, you know, the, are covered by the Supreme Court hearing or the Supreme Court case right now. I mean, look at Alana Omar and her, you know, she was encouraging, or at least Maxine Waters, remember, was encouraging people to threaten and intimidate and harass Trump officials back during the Trump administration. And there's now this, these leftists disrupting college campuses, threatening and attacking Jews, breaking the law repeatedly. And... Uh, you know, then then Ilan Omar is is uh, you know trying to defend this leftism. Let's go to this tweet I put out about her. Like I have to walk up a little closer. I can't read. Conflict of interest. Ilan Omar's daughter suspended from Columbia Sister School following congressional hearing. The Minnesota congressman repeatedly downplayed violations by anti-Israel protesters and accused the school of unfairly targeting pro-Palestinian activists. So there you have a far left, as far as I'm concerned, Ilan Omar is a, is a communist, defending her fellow communist terror supporters, supporters, and of course she's gonna defend her daughter, I don't blame her for that, sitting in the house. And did you see all the news this week with uh, these terrorist left-wing supporters? Left-wing terrorist supporters, how's that? shutting down our, our airlines, airports, closing roads. Where's the, where's, where's the Biden administration? Where's Secretary Pete Buttigieg, the awful transportation secretary who spends all of his time talking about racist roads? We had a coordinated effort to shut down our national infrastructure by the left. Zero response from the Biden administration that I could see. And at the same time, 
the same Justice Department is in the Florida Supreme Court talking about how they are, well, admitting to essentially stretching the law to target their political opponents under the pre a pretext excuse of January 6th. <sighs> There's a lot going on. And of course, you know, Congress isn't doing much with Joe Biden. You know, there's a congressional impeachment investigation that continues. I've been warning you that they're setting the stage for shelving impeachment entirely. They'll probably have referrals, which won't go anywhere. But they won't vote on impeachment for Biden. I, I'm convinced that's the, the plan. And so it's up to Judicial Watch again to come in and save the day. Well, maybe not literally save the day but at least do some of the basic heavy lifting that Congress refuses to do and show leadership on these issues. We just filed a lawsuit against the intelligence chief for Joe Biden, the director of Office of National Intelligence, for a damage assessment related to the removal of classified uh, materials by Joe Biden. Now, I think as vice president, Joe Biden had the right to have classified materials. He could take them with him under the law. But that's not the rules the Justice Department are pretending to follow with Trump. He wasn't supposed to have them, right? These are the new rules. And when classified information is taken away from their place where they're supposed to be secure, mishandled, uh, the agencies responsible can and should do what they call a damage assessment to see if there was, quote, any spillage of classified information, there's been any damage to national security because the classified information may have been mishandled. And uh, her, the special counsel who gave Biden a get out of jail free card, reported the documents were found at Biden's home in Delaware and at the Penn Biden Center in Washington, D.C. Who had access to those documents in both locations? Did the intelligence community just rely on her just to kind of give Trump a, a Biden a pass? Or did they do a damage assessment? I understand one was done for the Trump stuff. I think one was done. At least I have it in my head. But you can, you can look it up and see if I'm right. Either way, they're stonewalling our request for the information. Was one done? Give it to us. Our request was for damage assessments and equity reviews performed by the Office of Director of National Intelligence related to the materials improperly removed by Biden. As I say in our lawsuit, press release, the public deserves to know what the intelligence director's office concluded about Joe Biden's unlawful mishandling of highly classified documents. Now, you may recall her gave Biden a pass using the excuse that Biden's memory was awful and no jury would convict him. Yet he's still allowed to remain as president? I don't, I don't know. I still don't understand how that works. If Garland believes that Biden's memory is fine, then he should reject her conclusion and prosecute Biden, right? Because presidents don't want, they no longer have immunity under the new rules. Because the current, there's a big fight next week in the Supreme Court whether former President Trump had immunity from his, for acts he um, engaged in officially as president of the United States. Could he be prosecuted after he leaves office? If the new rules are changed to upend our constitutional system and um, make him subject to prosecution after he leaves office, by what rule would he, uh, his current president, not be subject to prosecution while in office?
So the cover-up continues to protect Joe Biden while the same agencies abuse, harass, and try to jail Trump on exactly the same type of crime. And again, it's Judicial Watch that comes in. And, and where's Congress on this? Her testified, then they move on. We also have a lawsuit, by the way, related to her. You know, he testified, I mean, I shouldn't say testified, he was interviewed, Joe Biden was interviewed by the special counsel, and the transcript was released. We sued for the transcript, they released it shortly after we sued. But are there audio? We think there are audio and video recordings of the interview of Joe Biden. It's a big controversy about what Joe Biden was saying and what his demeanor was and his memory and, and all of that and her conclusions about that interview. So the audio and or video would provide us great insight there. Why, is, why are they stonewalling us? We're in court now. They're stonewalling us. We may have more information at the end of the month, but it looks like uh, they're engaging, engaging in DOJ's engaging in games to try to stall the resolution of this lawsuit one way or the other. But right now they're hiding what looks to be at least audio recordings and perhaps video recordings. It's not clear whether there are video recordings or not. But it's not just here in Washington we're doing the heavy lifting. We're in all over the country. Uh, our lawyers were, at least one of our lawyers, was in Nashville, Tennessee this week for two days of court hearings related to the manifesto of that transgender extremist who murdered six innocents at the Covenant School in Nashville. Now, we had asked for the through FOIA, the Tennessee FOIA law. I don't know what it's officially called in FOIA. It's an open records lawsuit in the Tennessee Fund. So anyway, it's the open records law in Tennessee. Um, and we sued last year, and it's been like a full year we haven't gotten this information. I mean, this is basic material that was picked up by the police. The police are ready to release it. And what happened is the parents and the school have come in, and, and the parents of the victims and the parents of school generally, and, and the school itself has come in to try to interfere and, and stop the release of the manifesto. Now, typically, this type of material would be released. And, I, you know, God help these families. I pray for them. But the people have a right to know what went on there. What was the motive behind this shooter? What was she doing? What was she thinking? Couldn't be prevented again by getting more insights there. And of course, there's this political side of it because the left is kind of nervous about this issue because of the spate of transgender extremist violence recently. So we had, it, it's been, this has been a very unusual case. It's gone up and down the court in Tennessee. Audrey Elizabeth Hale, a 28-year-old trans artist, was also killed by police after she murdered those poor six people. I think it was three young children, babies really, and three adults. The resolution of the case has been delayed over disputes about whether the school and school victims' parents could intervene and prevent the release of the manifesto and other material. And as I said in the lawsuit or in our press release, we urge the court to place the public's right to know above any political considerations. So we're representing uh, retired Hamilton County Sheriff James Hammond and the Tennessee Farm, uh, Firearms Association. You know, and, and members of the legislature in Tennessee want the information released because, of course, what the left is trying to do is use this terrible tragedy, this mass murder, as a pretext to restrict Second Amendment rights. So there's a lot of interest in figuring out what really went on here. And again, to describe it highlights the public interest. 
So Russ Nobile was representing our clients quite ably in these hearings in, in Nashville. And I think we have a clip of, oh, so put up, give a little context. There's this unusual twist to the story that uh, the parents have somehow obtained the copyright for the manifesto, or so it's been asserted, and therefore from the murderer's family. So the family victims own the copyright they say for the manifesto and therefore we shouldn't be able to get them through our public FOIA request that predated their supposedly getting the copyright. I mean, it's, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I've been, we've been doing FOIA here at Judicial Watch a long, long time. This is like a mighty unusual argument to keep us from getting access to government records about a mass shooting copyright. Very unusual. And so Russ Gray's, uh, Russ Nobile, uh, one of our senior attorneys, uh, kind of answered some of these issues or, re or kind of talked through them with the court. And uh, it's interesting to see. So here's the clips. What we're really talking about is, you know, whatever these writings are, we presume some of them are created by Ms. Hale. We don't know if all of them are, but we presume, you know, a good portions of them are. We're talking about the copies of them. Right, Metro got the originals, the master, the master copy, if you will, and now they are retaining copies of it. And they've made copies for the FBI, they've made copies for the court, and they've made copies for whoever else. And once they've made copies, those are government records. And then, if they want to enforce their copyright, uh, um, then then that's something that will happen down the line when they register it and they determine if we're using it in fair use in federal court subsequently. So it's your position that the copies not necessary. So. If the originals are copyright, they have a, a copyright from inception, the copies are actually the worked product of Metro. Is, is that what you're saying? I, 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 I worry that work product is a critical term, but I, I will I, um, have more legal significance than I appreciate. But what I want to say is that when Metro makes a copy of it, that's definitely a government record. So, and that would be like the Griffin case, right? If, if you that is my sense, yeah, 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 more more akin to it. So, you know, but you know, at the end of it, if they get the originals back because they're claiming their copyright or, or, or whatever, if Metro has a copy of it still, and Metro sent a copy off to the FBI, we get a copy of that, or that's subject to our request. And so, then, are you saying that the, the copies that are retained in <clears throat> Metro's investigative file do not have a copyright, they're not original works, and they are subject to the TPRA? They're derivative products of original works, is what I best understand. And I, I've taken some copyright, I'm not an expert on it, so I want to be careful here. Uh, but, you know, they have to produce it, there's no subject, there's no exception, it does not appear to be under the Tennessee law. Our clients get it, all of us are involved in either research or advocacy or education that's one of the prime missions of my organizations and why we we help bring these cases is to educate the public on what their government is doing uh, so we all fall under that umbrella and then once we get it if we use it and they register it and then they can assert their copyrights and then they'll have to defend your position as the copies made by metro for their investigative file are definitively public records the question is, is they're subject to an exception? So once Metro, I mean, all of this is about, I mean, we talked about a master tape from a recording artist. I don't want to keep using her name. But, um, you know, the journals are the master tapes, and copies have been made for them, and now that's a public record that is subject to the TPRA definitively. And uh, the question is, is it subject to an exception? We do not believe copyright is an exception under Tennessee law, as best we've seen. The court has asked about supremacy. Uh, supremacy comes in a lot of different postures, explicit, uh, express, or implied preemption. Uh, the court, I don't think, has to get into that here. It's a very, it's, it's complex to me uh, uh, question, and I don't know that it matters in this context because it only comes up when they assert their, uh, it should come up later when they assert their uh, copyrights and whatever they want to challenge our use of it at that point. That was interesting, huh? I wanted to, it's, and it's rare to be able to get a taste of some of these FOIA arguments uh, because typically they're not covered uh, by cameras in the courtroom in Tennessee. They allow cameras in the courtroom. It's rare here in federal court uh, where we do a lot of our work. 
But you know, it shows you nothing's ever easy, right? And this kind of was a straightforward FOIA request and case, and it's turned into this Megillah. Now, the court did not uh, decide about what she wants to do, and she asked for more briefing on these issues, including the copyright issue that Russ was talking about. So hopefully we get word soon, and you know, I suspect no matter what happens, there'll be an appeal. Uh, so this case will continue. Uh, and what, you know, your support's so important for our work because, you know, what seems like a simple case requires, it's gonna be probably two years by the end. It's, it probably will be with, I shouldn't say two years, a year and a half at least for this one simple request to get fully litigated and maybe we won't even get the documents in the end. And it's only because of your support are we able to kind of be in the case for as long as it takes to get these records and to follow up. So we'll see what happens here. Um, Russ did good work. Our legal team is doing great work. Uh, it's been a lot of work uh, on, on this, this battle about this terrible shooting. And of course, the left has a big interest in these cases, and so that's why it's important uh, that we stand for the right to know there. So I'll let you know what happens when it happens. <sighs> so now the big news. Well, there's been a lot of big news here today, right? But really big news in uh, new documents from the FBI that were just turned over to us. Uh, about Fauci's gain-of-function research. The FBI was investigating the Fauci agency. Now, we had uncovered that in March of 2022. We covered, uncovered it two years ago that the uh, FBI up in Newark was investigating Fauci's gain-of-function funding operations. You know, Fauci was funding gain-of-function in China and elsewhere. Now, Fauci has denied its gain-of-function, I think falsely, in a way that raises questions of perjury. Uh, but certainly the FBI thought there might be something up and they were doing, conducted an investigation. And to this day, I've been astonished that no one's been asking questions about what the FBI did and whatever happened with that investigation. So of course, who, who, did, who was asking questions? Judicial Watch. You know, we uncovered this document in this batch of materials from uh, you know, the early part of 2022, we followed up with the field office or asked for records about what was going on in that field office. It was the Newark field office of the FBI. I don't know why they had it. Who knows? And we got new documents that are truly astonishing because the FBI almost immediately knew what was up about gain of function. And the documents are here. I'll show you what they look like, at least as we get them. Oh, I, I guess I was looking at the other camera. There we are. That's what they look like. There's a cover letter. They withheld some information from them. Um, the names of some of the agents involved and their, yeah, the names of the FBI agents involved, at least the lower level ones, which I object to, but there's probably not much we can do about that. The senior agent, his name was, um, he was kept in, Gregory Yeary, who was the special agent in charge of the Washington field office. So he was involved in the investigation. So this was a senior level FBI investigation of the Fauci gain of function applications. And uh, so it's a chain, essentially it's a chain of emails that begin in, excuse me. that begin in April, begin on April 23rd. So they're all on that one, it looks like it's all within one day. So it's an email chain, right? You've all seen email chains. You read it from the bottom to the top, right? And um, I guess there are two email chains.
So the FBI examined the, the NIAID grant for gain of function in China, and they immediately termed it gain of function. So the FBI disputes Fauci's decision to hide the nature of and testify that he was not supporting gain of function, because this is an FBI document that disputes that. The details of the current NIAID grant for the Wuhan Institute of Virology, Bat Coronavirus, Bat Coronavirus Surveillance, and the Wuhan Institute of Virology, Bat Coronavirus Gain of Function Research are available at, and they provide a link to where they are available. The key activity for bat coronaviruses are surveillance. Bat for, excuse me, the key activity for bat, let me start over. The key activity for bat coronavirus surveillance is aim one. We will sequence receptor binding domains, spike proteins, there you go, to identify viruses with the highest potential for spillover, which we will include in our experimental investigations. The key activity for bat coronavirus gain of function, the FBI email goes on to say, is AIM-3. We will use S-protein sequence data, infectious clone technology, infectious clone technology, in vitro and in vivo infection experiments and analysis of receptor binding to test the hypothesis that a percentage divergence thresholds in S-protein sequences predict spillover potential. And then the FBI uh, analyst change, uh, translates it. Translated into lay language, this equates to, in AIM-3, we will use de novo synthesis to construct novel viruses encoding different spike proteins in otherwise constant genomic, in an otherwise constant genomic context. And we will test the ability of the resulting novel viruses to infect human cells in culture and to infect laboratory animals. We hypothesize that there is a direct correlation between the receptor binding affinity of the spike protein and the abilities to infect human cells and culture and to infect laboratory animals. We will test this hypothesis by asking whether novel viruses encoding spike proteins with the highest receptor binding affinity have the highest abilities to infect human cells and culture and to infect laboratory animals. And this is the kicker. The reason I am writing is that the experimental strategy proposed in AIM-3, infectious clone technology, if performed using commercial or in-house gene synthesis, is to prepare the infectious clones, would leave no signatures of purposeful human manipulation. Again, that's their emphasis there. No signatures of infectious purposeful manipulation. I tell you folks, this is a smoking gun. This is the FBI acknowledging that the purpose of gain of function, an, an, obvious, an obvious use of gain of function is to create a virus that doesn't have fingerprints showing that it was manipulated by human hands or technology. I mean, can you, can you believe it? And again, this was released by Judicial Watch not by Congress, not by the media. It was forced out through a FOIA request from last year that was following on a FOIA release that was forced out through a FOIA lawsuit. So this is years in the making, getting this basic information about what we're told is the worst thing in the history of humanity in terms of an infectious disease, and they've been hiding this FBI document from us for four for four years. Judicial Watch's heavy lifting gets results for you, the American people, so that there's some accountability here. To me, this further highlights and demonstrates why Fauci needs to be prosecuted or his scandal needs to be investigated criminally. What was the FBI doing here? Was this a criminal investigation? Were they just messing around here? What was the outcome? 
Is it continuing? <sighs> and then later, one of the emails, so look at, look at what the, her, his colleague says. Let's bring up the email about this one. Hey, are you going to be in the office tomorrow? We just interviewed our person from blank again, and he provided us with some alarming new info. Give me a call if you can. What's that info? This is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Pretty much everything we know of significance about, by the way, much of the key COVID issues, whether it be the origin in China, the funding of it, and Fauci's big lies about it, uh, the vaccine scams and schemes and dishonesty and withholding of key information has been the result of Judicial Watch litigation and FOIA requests. And in response to all of this, the head FBI official in the Newark office, a senior official within the agency, this is interesting, I'm he writes, I'm following up with the squad tomorrow morning. So was this all hands on deck? As I write in the release, or I guess I'm quoted. <laughs> I think I wrote this. These smoking gun documents show the FBI quickly understood that Fauci's agency funded gain of function research that could disguise the resulting coronaviruses as natural. These new documents further demonstrate the need for a comprehensive criminal investigation into Fauci's gain of function scandal. And in our release, we go through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen major disclosures by Judicial Watch on COVID. So I encourage you to go look at the full release. I can't go through all of them here. I guess I could, but I don't think I don't think I have the time today to do it. Literally, if I got to get home. So what's happening on the Hill? I mean, there's been some news, you know, Rand Paul's gotten some material out. Uh, there's been questions about other people hiding records and, and maybe keeping them off, off the books, so to speak, by keeping them in private servers as opposed to government servers. I'm not quite sure what's happening there. But this is a smoker, isn't it? And I tell you, there's, it's another reason, because as I go through this, uh, we have a big book coming out later this year, another Judicial Watch book, that will cover a lot of this COVID stuff and, and put it all in one place, uh, these important disclosures, so that the historical record is clear about what happened and who's responsible. And I had a tweet up earlier. I don't think we pulled it up for this show. I guess it's easy for me to remember because I said in a tweet, and I'll say it here, Fauci did it. He did it. They set up these mutant coronaviruses in China and were expected to believe they had nothing to do with COVID. Now, does this show that the gain of function led to COVID? No, but it's more circumstantial evidence that it was possible. Now, it used to be I'd be banned for even thinking that, or at least saying it. They haven't figured out a way to ban me for thinking things yet, right? The censor us for thinking. Just give them a few more years. 
But if I said this a few years ago, we would have been have these videos taken down. But because of our, as I say, our heavy lifting, the truth has come out. And it's inescapable now that we were funding gain-of-function research for years in China. We knew it was gain-of-function research. As soon as COVID hit, the Chinese, working with Fauci's agency, covered it up. And part of that covered up involved the censorship of American citizens from raising these legitimate questions, even as the FBI is pursuing the same allegations. There's got to be accountability. And the first step to accountability is kind of getting the basics of the truth out. And that's why Judicial Watch's work is so important. So I encourage you to share these documents far and wide. Because if you think this is issue is just going to end, or we don't have to be worried about anything because COVID is over, practically speaking, you're wrong. Gain of function research goes on here in the United States. Some of these disclosures I'm talking about include disclosures of gain of function happening here in the United States improperly. Why is gain of function dangerous? As I discussed, you change the virus, the subject virus, to make it more communicable, more likely to infect human beings potentially more dangerous, increase their function, gain of function. You're putting the humanity at risk, potentially. So that was quite the update. But it ain't over, because I promised I would answer some of your questions. Did you email some of the questions to me, Sean? Yes. Let me look at the questions. I didn't. I'm going to answer the questions as best I'm able. Let's go. Paula wants to know why, with all you have co uncovered, is no one in jail? Well, that's to me a failure of our government. Uh, there's more than enough information to prosecute all sorts of people based on the information just uncovered by Judicial Watch. I mean, I've been tweeting about Hillary recently, uh, highlighting how she barely escaped prosecution, not once, but twice, back during the Clinton years for her Whitewater-related fraud and obstruction and lies, and then obviously over her emails and pay-to-play scandals. I mean, that wasn't Judicial Watch that failed to prosecute her. So all we can do is educate, right? We're a nonprofit educational foundation, and we've educated prosecutors, certainly Congress, to be able to do the right thing. So that's more work we have to do, admittedly. Why haven't they charged Biden, Harris, Mayorkas, Pelosi, and or Schumer with treason for the border invasion? Well, treasonous activity related to the border invasion, I think, I don't know if treason's the right word, maybe it is, but it's a rule of law crisis that's been second to none in recent memory. I mean, never before has our president and all of his people conspired to collapse the border of the United States uh, to benefit tens of millions of foreign nationals to aid and abet an invasion. I don't think our system even contemplates what to do in those situations. And you were highlight the treason aspect. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Why haven't they charged Biden, Harris, Mayorkas, and Pelosi, and Schumer with treason for the, Oh, wait, I just read that. Uh, what is the real reason Biden is not being charged for having classified documents? Asked Jack D. on Facebook. What is the real reason Biden is not charged? I know, well, do I know what the real reason is in the sense that I have special knowledge of what <laughs> the Biden Justice Department's doing? No. But you're smart, I suspect, and you know what the, one of the reasons are. Is Biden's guilty of the crimes for which they're targeting Trump uh, and they don't want to prosecute him because they don't want to lose power. 
It's simple. It's usually just about obtaining or retaining, expanding power. That's usually why corrupt politicians get away with it. Why can't someone push for photos and electronic fingerprints for illegals coming across our border? Well, I don't know if someone isn't pushing for it. My question to you, who is asking this question? Colin C., what difference would it make with this Biden administration? They just have pictures of everyone crossing the border. It's not like they're picking them up. Maybe it might be easier for them to get, get picked up if we get a president who wants to actually enforce the law against them. But I'm not quite sure what biometric data, if any, they take of aliens crossing the United States. I'm sure our friends, and this is the wonderful thing about the internet, I'm gonna ask you, dear listener, dear viewer, to um, click some info and provide some info links as to what biometric data that the Biden administration takes of the aliens they're uh, helping uh, invade our country. It'd be interesting to find that out. So those are some of the questions we had, and I'll try to do this from time to time. Uh, we've had some live Instagram, Facebook, YouTube videos earlier this week. We've been trying to track a little bit of the Trump trial. So come back to these channels often, and you may see me pop up live in addition to uh, our weekly update here. Well, before I go, I want to thank you again for your support. You can see that Judicial Watch is just doing remarkable work on election integrity, on uh, combating these core threats to our republic, on basic FOIA government accountability issues, exposing the invasion, highlighting these rule of law issues that so few in Washington want to avoid. And we can't do it without your support. I encourage you to support Judicial Watch. Go to our website at judicialwatch.org, judicialwatch.org. If you've supported us before, thank you. If you haven't supported us before, I encourage you to support us now with your most generous donation. And frankly, if you've don donated to us previously, donate again. We still need a lot of work to be, there's still a lot of work to be done to protect our republic, protect our country. And so God bless you, God bless America, and be sure to pray for America in these trying times. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and like our video down below.